Hello everyone and welcome to Atomic Mass Transmissions Live. I'm Director of Product Development Will Schick. Excited to be back here with you this week uh, in honor of the Halloween extravaganza that's coming to us at the end of the week. Uh, we thought, it, what perfect time to go back, revisit one of our favorite characters, my favorite character, our favorite character, I'll speak for everyone, uh, which is Ghost Rider. So I've got my Ghost Rider prepped and ready to go. Uh, we'll probably also take some time as we paint this fella to talk about some of the rebalances that are coming his way as well. I might have a card or two to show off uh, as we get into the stream, but I hope all of you had a great weekend. Can't wait to uh, spend this next hour with you. With that, let's get this camera off of me and onto the star of our show, which is Johnny Blaze himself, the Ghost Rider. So I'm just going to start things off and find my holder blue. And oh my gosh, did the folks for me? Oh, there's my nose. Really, it just leaves stuff everywhere. It's crazy. We'll find it. Maybe we won't. Maybe we'll use a missile blue. It's fine. Oh, that might be it. Uh, nope, definitely not. All right, well, whatever. It's all good. I know, the signature, it's truly the signature, like, studio color, but I can't find it, so we're not going to use it because there are paints, like, literally everywhere here, and I don't see it. So we'll just start with Abyssal Blue, which I like as well. And we'll start knocking out some of these leathers on our Ghost Rider. It'll be great. And then we have to decide what color we're going to paint his spooky flames. So if you have an idea on what you want to see in the chat, you should let me know. Because we've painted, I've painted normal flames on a Ghost Rider. I've painted blue flames on a Ghost Rider. I thought green flames might be kind of fun. Um, you can do purple flames. This guy's kind of the limit. I might give him cowboy boots this time too, just for funsies. Then that out just a little bit more. A little darker than what I want. But yeah. Hopefully everyone's having a good time. I saw that yesterday BK posted up a really great article from one William Pagani, uh, who, uh, turn on my light here really quick that I forgot to turn on, maybe. There we go. Sweet. More light's always better. Um, but yeah, article went up about the upcoming core rules changes for Marvel Crisis Protocol. Seen some community chatter on that. Most of it was, if you've been with us on several streams now, or if you hung out with us at Mini Stravaganza back when we announced all of these cool changes come into the game, uh, we kind of went over it quite a bit. The one difference, or the one new piece of information, of course, being that the loser of priority now gets to pick the threat level for the game, which is really nice because it stops a lot of that automatic, like, I know which threat, or which crisis I want to play. I know exactly which squad I'm going to take in because I'm going to win priority. I'm going to choose my secures and my extracts, and I'm going to get to play at 15 threat, 19 threat, whatever it happens to be. So again, as we talked about during Mini Stravaganza, one of the biggest goals that we had with all the kind of adjustments that we made, especially to that first that pre-game, that turn zero play stuff, was just making things a little more uh, random and harder to pre-plan for, which forces players to rely instead on having a more robust understanding of their rosters. Uh, it removes some of the paralysis that can come when you're new to the game and you quite don't have everything figured out. You get really afraid you're going to make the wrong, mis the wrong move or you didn't plan something out. Now... Some of that has been removed and put into chance again, which is uh, if you've played Crisis Protocol and dealt with how our dice love to dice, uh, randomization and chance is definitely something we lean into as part of the game experience. And of course, the other thing that we really want is we want that emphasis to be on characters and on the characters that you play and the tactics that you use. And so removing more of that control over turn zero all leads to that because now you really have to think, okay, well, I'm really great at playing this secure, or this extract, at this threat value, or my roster is really tuned for this threat value, but now I might not get to pick that. A good opponent can counterplay around those picks. They can force you into situations where you might have to adapt your tactics and your strategy, and that's really where I think a lot of the fun in these games lies, and especially kind of where we dial in 
the crisis protocol experience where we want it to land is on the actual gameplay itself. So turn zero is important, obviously. Having reps with your lists are important, knowing what you want to do. All of that's still really important if you want to play at a high competitive level. But at the end of the day, the heart and soul of Crisis Protocol is crises, and we don't get to pick our crises. We just have to adapt and deal with them when they come up. And I think a lot of those changes all do that stuff. Green flames, pink flames, my gosh. We can do pink flames probably. Uh, why not? I'm going to find this color. No, that color is really purple. I don't want that color. I want a brown. Give me a brown. Sure, why not? Brown leather. Seems great. No, this is just, uh, this color is just abyssal blue. So all I did was I just thinned it out on my wet palette. Or you could use a well palette like normal if you wanted to. Oh my gosh, that was like all medium. Ah. I'm happy to do pink. I love painting pink. Maybe we'll work a little purple in it, make it kind of cool. Um, but anyway, I just took the Abyssal Blue and did a quick kind of uh, wash of it over my Zenith Prime. And it works out real nice. Simple, but effective. And now I think we're just going to... I think we'll, we'll give him brown boots, why not? It's a little different. Normally he's in like the all blacks, but we'll give him the brown boots. <laughs> just kind of want to like knock out his colors really quick. And then we'll move on to the flames. But I painted a lot of all black Ghost Riders. I feel like we can add a little splash of color to him. Dallas did a Ghost Rider, I think, on stream. That was really cool. He added some browns to his blacks and kind of gave it that worn, dyed leather look that turned out really nice. I don't have probably enough time, especially because I mostly want to paint those super sweet flames today because those are the fun part. So we'll worry about taking all this stuff to the max a little later. Uh, yeah, why not? We'll make his, we'll make his, his riding gloves, we'll make those brown too, just to get some nice variety into our color scheme. Maybe we'll go in and do the belt as well. Knock that stuff out. Yeah, I don't know how many of you were able to join us for the, uh, and talking about dice dicing. I've never seen dice dice quite as hard as when Josh, the one and only Cologne, comes on stream to play. <laughs> we had quite the roller coaster of the game last week on Thursday. Uh, or I think I rolled defense like a monster ten times in a row and he was able to do literally nothing for several turns of the game, which I felt kind of bad about. But at the same time, I wasn't really doing anything. I was just rolling the dice. Uh, but that will go down in history probably as my most successful uh, defending game ever because I've never had characters get attacked so many times and deal, have no damage dealt to them in general. But I always love playing with Josh. It's so fun to have him on stream. It's such a huge part of everything that happens for Crisis Protocol, being in charge of the art as the art director. We get to talk all day about Marvel characters and looks and costumes and all kinds of wild and crazy stuff. So it's always fun to have him out. He's a great sport, puts on a good show, it's very fun. I'm not going to do red and orange. I believe that the current the current vote was for pink flames, so we're going to do some pink flames. Uh, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. Ms. Marvel and Hulkbuster. So yes, there was um, there was a little bit of a kerfuffle when it came to the global release dates, and some folks got them in early, and they were sent out uh, despite all of the communications otherwise. So they are in the UK, I believe, um, because 
of that error, we are going to update those two characters with the next errata FAQ and affiliations update. And so that's going to happen, I believe, the first Friday of November, like they usually do. So they'll be in there. Um, unfortunately, that's as fast as we can really update that stuff because it still does have to go through the proper licensing channels and everything. And we were not prepared uh, at all for those to suddenly appear in people's hands and on store shelves. So I will say um, sorry for those folks who might have to wait just a little bit longer to get official confirmation on the affiliations uh, and everything with them. We are working to make sure that you'll have all that info as fast as possible. So bear, bear with us a little bit. Be excited for the fact that you might have gotten an exclusive early access to those really cool characters and everything that you need to know about them will be coming in that next errata and FAQ doc. Uh, but it kind of gave us a little bit of a head spin. And so we had to rush to adjust and make sure that we could get into that next thing. So there you go. As far as US release dates, uh, I don't have any new information. The port and rail systems in the US are still very much out of whack. So unfortunately, um, I can't really give you anything. I know that BK is working on a bit of an official announcement, mostly to say exactly what I'm saying, which is, unfortunately, global shipping is still very much in shambles right now. The US is struggling through a number of different problems. So we don't really have any great info to give. The second that we do, however, um, we will, of course, immediately provide it to everyone. But we're still very much at the whims of COVID and what it's done to the entire shipping supply chain. There has to be, am I just gonna make it up? I'm just gonna make it. I was, I was looking for the black metal, but I don't see it anywhere. So we're just going to really quickly take some thrash metal and some black and mix it up that way. Um, so that's unfortunately like that's where we're at uh, on U.S. release dates. Um, I believe the Mystic stuff last I heard was likely to arrive on source shelves in November. But of course, don't quote me on that because I could be completely wrong because I don't get regular updates from production. Um, best I can tell everybody is that obviously we are as excited as you are for all of this stuff to get to you, for stores to have it, for everyone to get it on their game tables, all that stuff. Like there is no secret conspiracy or joy taken from the fact that right now uh, everyone's struggling to get the things that they desperately want. And all any of us can really do, along with all of our fine feathered friends, that's, that's what I would normally say. So I guess I'll say it here. Uh, inside Asmodee's production and shipping and logistics department, like everybody wants the, the problem solved as quickly as possible. No one really has the power to solve it, <laughs> unfortunately. So you play with the hand that you're dealt, and uh, we go from there. So, But the second we have relevant information, uh, we're always the first to put it out, whether it's through the streams or online or anything like that. Um, you know, I know it's not the wonderful, like, happy holiday news everyone wants to hear, but it's the most transparent I can be about the situation and where we're sitting. Uh, and that's really all I ever claimed to do. I'm kind of painting this metal, but I think we're going to wind up making it colored. That's okay. So we're going to get those flames in there. What else we got on? Yeah, updated stat cards for those asking. Uh, as we discussed at, oh no. As we discussed during Mini Stravaganza and have talked about um, several times, which. Uh, I know we always have new viewers, and that's awesome, and folks don't always see everything, so I'm happy to go over it. We will be posting the adjusted stat cards for the characters that we've shown off, in addition to the characters that we have yet to show off. Those will go up mid-November. Uh, they are currently all completed, 
We are just about to package them and send them off for license and approvals and all that stuff. So development is effectively done. Uh, I will say that I think there have been a couple of minor tweaks since Mini Stravaganza uh, because we've continued to look at them and work on them and stuff like that since the announcement. Um, but overall, it's going to look pretty much on point. If you've seen them in an article, pretty much safe to say that that's how they're going to be. Um, and those will go up along with the core rules adjustment and everything else, hopefully right before American Thanksgiving. Got to be specific about that because I know that there's a couple of different versions of that holiday, especially in North America. So the U.S. Thanksgiving holiday should be up before then so everyone can enjoy them over the holidays. And then sometime next year, probably by summer, uh, of course, everything again that I say is kind of a TBD based on how global shipping and everything else continues to work out. Uh, those, we will have a new card pack that will include team tactic cards as well as all of the updated stat cards. And that will be coming out to print. So for those who don't want to have the simply printed out versions of the stat cards, you can pick up that pack and more than likely if you play Marvel Crisis Protocol you're going to want to pick up that pack anyway because it's going to give you a whole wealth of team tactic cards that you're going to want anyway so it's a win-win-win. We'll be talking more about the specifics of that pack and everything to expect as we get closer for right now. That is just the answer to how to get the cards. So they'll be available online before the end of the year. Mid next month is the current targeted date. All things willing through reviews and approvals and everything else that goes on. So many steps. And then the physical print cards will be available in a card pack along with a bunch of other cards next year, probably around the summertime until something changes and then we adjust and that date, you know, maybe comes sooner, probably not. Might get shifted a little later, depends on how global shipping and everything else continues to go. It's very difficult to say, but as we know more, we'll let you know more. It's the best we can do. Let's see. Uh, how could you fix the chain on your Ghost Rider? Well, depending on how it's snapped, um, you should be able to pretty easily repair the chain using like uh, thin plastic cement because you can melt and fuse the chain together. The other way that I think you could fix it um, is you could take jeweler's chain, so actual chain, um, kind of put it into the position that you want and then very carefully apply super glue over it to set it into place. Um, it would take some care and you might not get the full, the full fledged like loop de loop. Um, but you can freeze jeweler's chain with um, super glue pretty effectively. And I've seen some pretty crazy stuff done with that. So that could be a, a possibility. Your Ghost Rider would definitely be a little more unique. Um, but, you know, without seeing exactly how it snapped, it's a little difficult. Yeah, you could chop it up, wrap it across his body, um, maybe reposition the arm down so he's, like, closer to the thing. Uh, there's definitely a way to do that. Da -da -da. <laughs> so if you want to see the front of that She-Hulk, you certainly can. She's actually one that I painted on stream back when She-Hulk was about to be released, I think. Um, I did cheekily choose colors that evoke a different team affiliation that doesn't exist currently, um, partially because I really like painting blue and I wanted to paint a little bit of white. She does not have any logo on her though, um, of any type, and it's not, it's not indicative of anything that's coming. So, uh, it was painted a long, long time ago just for funsies, and I thought that would be a cool color scheme to do. And so that's what we did. Okay. 
Uh, there's lots of other things that I would love to do to this guy, but we only have 40 minutes. And I think we want to spend most of our time painting the cool fire, so we're going to do that. I'm just going to really quickly black out the seat. Uh, so like some of the big things that I want to go back through are clean up the black, add some more depth and shadows to it. Um, definitely do a wash over the brown, add some scratches and scritches, and then the other big thing that I would do here would be to highlight up the metallics on the bike. Um, I just want to black out these wheels really quick because that'll be important for making our flames look right. But for the most part, it just would be defining highlights and shadows a bit more, getting some volumes in there, creating a bit more life into the colors that we've already picked out. However, oh, I noticed that I forgot the front wheel. That's okay. Um, this gets us pretty close to where we need to be just to be able to do the cool bits. I'm just going to quickly go back to my black metallic here. And I got to get this wheel guard. Ooh. Needs more black. color, but we're going to get that pink in there, so it's not really going to matter. Uh, da, 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 da. Trust me, if we officially announce something, it's on the website, it's not hard to find. If it's a real thing, uh, you'll know. <laughs> so don't always believe or trust everything that you see that gets leaked or spoiled online because some of that information is no longer good. Some of it's like way wrong timed um, in terms of like when somebody decided to leak it or release it or whatever. If it's official and it's a thing that we want you to know about or that you should know about, uh, the first place you'll find it is anywhere with an atomic mass place. So. <laughs> Well, we can get rid of the rubber on the tires if we definitely want to, but it's a good place to start, so. Okay. Uh, <laughs> who brought them up? You know, talking about the pose of Ghost Rider, he was never meant to have the bike, actually. Um, he was designed as one of, I mean, I'll admit, there's definitely some favoritism when it comes to, like, starting a project and just being excited about certain things, and because Ghost Rider for me is one of my all-time favorite Marvel like characters. I, I certainly knocked out a quick uh, sketch of his design and how he would work. And at the time I didn't think we could do the bike. Um, so originally he was just, you know, like everyone else, just by himself on a base. And the idea was, is that he summoned the bike through uh, his superpower, which he obviously kept uh, in his bigger form, but the bike was abstracted. And then as we finally got to the point where doing Ghost Rider became like a real thing and we were talking about it with uh, Marco and Dallas and production, you know, and Dallas was a very big proponent of pushing on the bike and trying to see if we could do it. And so he and Marco worked and we figured out the specs and the design and, you know, what is it going to look like when it's all put together. And uh, yeah, it was, um, it was pretty wild to see it all come to fruition and come together and was very exciting. So, uh, it, it all kind of worked out in the end. Um, and we changed the design of him to ha have him be on the bigger base and he kept a lot of his original stuff. There's a sunset purple around here somewhere and I'm going to find it. There it is. <laughs> so, yeah, it, uh, it all worked out. Um, and that's just indicative of the amazing folks that I get to work with every day is that we're always pushing ourselves and uh, demanding a bit more than uh, what we think is possible and, you know, randomly somebody tries to be the sane one and then everyone else bucks against them and says, no, no, we can do better. <laughs> we can do more. We can be crazy. And uh, it, was, it was very cool. It was very fun and I'm really glad that we got him on the bike and we did talk a lot about the pose and, you know, the bike, obviously he had to be doing a wheelie for it to fit on 
the uh, for it to fit on the base because otherwise the bike was going to be a little too long. Dallas comes from a, a motorcycle centric family, so he was very, very focused on getting everything about the bike correct, and uh, and so it was fun. He'd he'd come in and he'd be like, "What do you? Can we do this? Can we do this type of bike? It's got to be this type of bike." And he was using terms that I had never heard of before. And I'm like, you just do it. I trust you. <laughs> like, at the point that you're using, you know, official terminology that I don't even recognize, I'm like, mm, you got this. You, you take it. And he did. He took it. And he and Marco and the sculptor uh, really knocked it out of the park. And Ghost Rider was kind of like one of those first characters where we started to really spread our wings and figure out, oh, we can do a heck of a lot more. Uh, and then once you know, once you open that Pandora's box, oh, I missed the back of these pipes. Ah, well, deal with it later. We'll fix it in post. Um, once you open that Pandora's box, then all of a sudden it's like, well, I guess I can just put this guy on this, or now we can make transforming characters, and we can do all this other stuff. And it's really cool how it super feeds off of every little thing, you know, somebody pushes in one direction and it impacts and has ripple effects in all these other directions, especially going forward. Um, so it's very neat, but yeah, Ghost Rider pose, not the original pose that was expected. Um, in every single way we thought, I thought, the, the original pitch for the, the miniature and everything was all about avoiding the bike and abstracting it. Uh, and so I, like many, I'm very thankful that that is not where we wound up because the badassness of what we got is so much better, so much more realized. I would never want Ghost Rider any other way. So... <laughs> Modoc was another fun one. I mean, definitely a character that here, we'll just do the we'll do the full on flamey wheel thing. Why not? Let's just go crazy. Modoc was another one that was very cool to do, very uh, unexpected as one of Marvel's initial suggestions that it should be a character that we do a little little focus on, a little love to. And uh, I was excited because I never thought that such a, such an eccentric and weird character would wind up, you know, being at launch. And um, but hey, it was, and that was great. And I think it really let us set a tone for what Crisis Protocol was going to be, which is, you know, Marvel that's accessible to all people and has its roots firmly planted in comics and isn't afraid to kind of go in and explore those lesser known weird characters uh, and use it as a way to expose, you know, folks to stuff like Baron Zemo, you know, at the time that the course that came out, Baron Zemo wasn't exactly the dancing phenom that he became and uh, certainly a character that I was really passionate about and had a great love for and was excited to bring to people's attention more and demonstrate what made him so cool and unique uh, and just to me like such a great such a great foil to Captain America even though Red Skull's in there and probably the more well-known Captain America villain uh, Zemo's always the number one for me all right so I think we've gone pretty we're pretty good on this. Oh, I want to get this. And I agree. I agree with the chat here. We're probably at the point now where let's talk a little bit about what changed on Mr. Ghost Rider on our Johnny Blaze. And maybe show a card while we let this purple wash dry. I'm just kind of like messing around here. There's no consistency. Just, we can always go back and wash that back in. So I think the first 
change to kind of talk about. It's pretty, pretty expected, um, which is Johnny Blaze, our ghostwriter, is now immune to incinerate. Uh, how that didn't happen in the first place was kind of just indicative of how the development process goes and what you're thinking about at the time. And like I said, all these characters that we're kind of taking a new look at were done very early on. Um, and there are things that are just evolve over time. So we weren't really thinking much about incinerate and that as a condition and stuff. And so I think it just kind of got forgotten. And uh, so we wound up with a flaming ghost rider who, you know, incinerate is very abstract. So it's not that the ghost rider couldn't be set on fire by something or burned by acid or anything like that. But I think, uh, you know, overall it was certainly something that always felt weird and was worth adjusting, and so we did. Uh, we also gave him immunity to bleed because he's a skeleton man, uh, and because we were already adding the line anyway, why not? Uh, it just made sense, and of course gives him a bit more protection from certain things uh, as a five threat character. And the last thing we did, which kind of came out from the benefit of working on the bigger Mystic Wave uh, and some of the stuff there was we gave him immunity to Hex uh, because, you know, he is, he is kind of protected by his pact with Mephisto and he's the spirit of vengeance and so he goes after all these supernatural like beings all the time. Uh, it would make sense that he would have some protection against that, so... Those, that was the first thing that we initially adjusted. Uh, and probably, like I said, the easiest one to note. So the other things that we looked at as we were working on Ghost Rider was a bit of his durability. So he's definitely a character. We talked about this way back when we first showed him off. You know, the idea behind Ghost Rider is that he punishes players who don't deal with him directly. Um, so the kind of the idea behind Ghost Rider is you can either go after him specifically and ignore kind of the rest of your opponent's squad um, until you've dealt with Ghost Rider so that Ghost Rider doesn't get amped up and come in and ruin you with all the things that he does. Uh, and if you do that, then obviously you're giving Ghost Rider power and kind of bumping him up. Uh, maybe we'll just try the fluorescence. Or, you know, you're ignoring him at your own peril, and when you do so, he's going to get charged up. Um, so going back to that original kind of mantra on everything, where we kind of wound up was, you know, there were two things that had to happen primarily. The first was Ghost Rider needed a little bit more durability so that if you did decide to focus on him, uh, he felt more like that threat five kind of staying power. So we increased his stamina on both of his sides by one, to give him that extra little bit of durability, it also put him more in line with some of the more five threats and let him play that game of, okay, well, if you attack me, that's great, but you're not going to be able to just, you know, take me out right away without some concentrated effort, and I'm going to wind up with a lot of power to be able to pen and stare, or do other things that I want to do as well. Um, the other bigger change, which ties right into this, is that his uh, Spirit of Vengeance power has been adjusted as well uh, and now no longer has a range on it. So originally the range 3 restriction was kind of there um, to make things to kind of rein Mr. Ghost Rider in. The problem is, is that it's pretty restrictive and as we discovered uh, didn't quite work perfectly with his kit. So, uh, one of the biggest things that we did in order to make sure that he had the power generation that he really wanted and you couldn't just choose to ignore him now that he was a bit more durable uh, or push him out of, you know, another big one was, well, I'll just push him out of range of his friends with all the displacement that's on the table or anything like that. You could work around. The counterplay was just a bit too simple. Um, and so now we've adjusted that. 
And no matter where he is or where his friends are, if you attack his teammates, he is going to power up from it. Uh, so that, of course, gives him way more options to do on his turn. It makes ignoring him and focusing on his team much more dangerous. But of course, you have the trade-off of if you want to take out Ghost Rider first, he's now more durable with more stamina. Um, so he really forces you into that decision-making process that we wanted out of the original character in ways that are much, much more accurate to our original intentions. Uh, and of course now, I think he really feels like he's fully deserving of the five threat in multiple situations. And it's just those small little tweaks that occurred to make it all work. Uh, so yeah, so I'm very excited very, very excited by Ghost Rider and his new changes. Uh, he's been a blast to play, although I enjoyed playing him before. The loosening up of the restrictions just makes for such a huge difference in terms of his flexibility and the role that he can play. And now he doesn't feel like he's working either to stay next to his friends so that he can generate power versus wanting to zip around the table on his hell cycle and, you know, uh, penance stare and beam attack with hellfire and all that stuff. His many enemies, opposing squad. Uh, and our playtesters had a bunch of fun with these new changes as well. Uh, it just makes everything kind of work more synergistically together, and I think it just reflects. I think we talked about a bit of that maturity of design and understanding that only comes with time and practice at something, uh, you know. And I think this is definitely, given the opportunity, if we could go back. And obviously this did exactly that. Um, you know, these are the spots where a lot of these characters that we did decide needed a little bit of an adjustment would have wound up at. You know, and you do get the benefit a little bit of that 2020 hindsight, but we also have all the benefit of this experience and working on the game and getting to continue to develop and design and exist within it. And you can't ask for much more than that because it just makes everything all the better. So, all right. So, there you go. <laughs> oh, that's true. This is the month for pink as well. So, uh, so for those who are curious on how I'm doing the pink, I just took um, sunset violet, sunset purple, sunset purple, which kind of shows up on camera. And then I'm just using the fluorescent hot pink, acid pink, sorry, acid pink. Um, and I'm just mixing those together on my wet palette. And then I'm just building up, uh, just building up those highlights on the flames. And this is just one of those things where if you're working with fluorescence, especially with like out an airbrush or anything like that, even with an airbrush, the airbrush just kind of makes the process a little quicker. Um, don't apply the fluorescence. Your best results are going to come from not applying the fluorescence directly from the pot because uh, they are very translucent because they're so punchy. They don't have a lot of opacity to them. You almost always want to mix them with another color. And so I'm mixing in with the Sunset Purple, and then as I start to brighten that stuff up, I will go to, uh, I will add in more white, like an off-white, maybe um, white sands, just because it's right in front of me, uh, to make my highlight colors. You can definitely dry brush these colors really well as well, uh, but when you do so, that becomes a process of kind of building up your foundations with your dry brush and then going through a dry brushing with whites uh, and then coming back over and dry brushing with like white mixed with your fluorescent color and just slowly building up those layers in that way. But pink is, I really like, I like painting purples and I like painting pink actually quite a bit. It's such a fun and weird color. 
to work with. Um, and I think it's, it's so striking. And of course it pairs beautifully with black. To make just such a bold color choice. So knock that stuff out. All right. Uh, doo -doo -doo. All right. Uh, what else we got? Was Wicked too good to work off him as well? I, uh, you might have to explain what the question is. I don't know if I understand exactly what you're asking about uh, with Wicked. Wicked's judgment still needed, definitely needed a range, if that's the question. Um, because just being able to like blow somebody up based on their crits from anywhere would be a little too good. <laughs> a little too good. But I'm not sure if that's exactly the intention of the question, so. I believe there's gonna, well, so this is timing of like when the articles and stuff go up, really more of a BK thing. Uh, I did turn over a Black Order article going over all of the adjustments that Black Order will be seeing. Ebony Ma, I can confirm, is certainly in that article. When that article will go up, I don't know. <laughs> that is more of a BK thing. I'm sure it will go up before all of the cards get posted. Or maybe it won't. I don't know. Maybe it'll be a retroactive look at, you know, like why. One of the things that's fun to do with those articles or that I enjoy doing about those articles is just like here where we can kind of chat and talk philosophy and the whys, why we made choices we did, what were we thinking at the time. Uh, those articles can kind of be a one-way dialogue where at the very least, you know, we can sit there and, and try to illuminate, okay, well, why was it the way it was? Well, for these reasons, you know. Um, a lot of emphasis on Ghostwriter, for instance, was given to Penn and Stare and the power that it represented and how it was just dusting characters off the table. And of course he was in a, like all these characters in a smaller subset. And so, you know, we, we balanced and tested based on all of the data we had and we wanted to make sure that everything felt correct at the time. And sometimes especially early on when you don't quite have the full view of where things are going or what you're going to be doing next. You kind of undershoot a little bit. Not always, but it does, it does happen. And so here we just kind of misjudged some play patterns, how spread out teams were going to be, what crises were going to influence what, you know, what more five threats would bring to the game in terms of options and choice. And so then it became a question of, okay, well, how do we go back now that we can do that and adjust a little bit for that? So, but those articles are certainly meant to kind of illustrate and point out where, okay, this is what we learned. This is why we changed what we did. This is kind of the philosophy that you've seen going forward. Let's continue on with our lives, right? Uh, okay, where are you? Sure, Blanco. <laughs> uh, I can't say anything about what's changed on Ma, but I will say that out of all the characters, I think Ma has probably seen, let me think before I put my foot in my mouth, I, from, my, from my opinion, oh, let's do it that way, in my opinion, uh, Ma has seen the most changes outside of Hulk. Like, Ma is definitely a very, a very big rework. Um, lots of stuff changed to kind of bring him in line with the original vision and everything that happened since then. And, and I am, as a 
big fan of Ebony Ma and the Black Order in general. I am really excited for people to see what we did. And I am both excited and terrified to see more Ebony Ma's on the table. <laughs> you know, which is always the hope. Uh, we want to see these characters appear more often for those that might have fallen a bit under the curve. And uh, we want people who love them to be excited for them. And obviously we want folks who play or really like an affiliation to just have more options. Um, you know, I can't wait to see the crazy Black Order lists that maybe don't have a reality gemmed Corvus, but they do have an Ebony Maw. What will that look like? What options will that open up? Especially with the changes to the turn zero plays and stuff, like that flexibility is just gonna become more and more important. Uh, and so, you know, hopefully this rebalance will affect some of that. You know, it's same thing with like the changes we showed off on Thursday. Um, the Guardians being more prevalent and we us seeing Peter Quill leading the team more often because the leadership is improved and Rocket and Groot being able to be taken more together as was the original intention and pairing better in terms of what you need them to do on the tabletop and stuff. That's all super great and exactly what our goal is and was in the first place. We just, you know, didn't quite get there. And that's okay. <laughs> so. But yeah, I'm excited for Ma. He was... Uh, Again, very similar to Hulk, one where it was an interesting thing to go back and be like, okay, well, I remember this guy just being screamed about in playtesting. Just screamed about how it's just too much, too oppressive, all this stuff. And sometimes that does happen and, you know, you adjust the dial a little too far or you adjust the dial just right, but because the game is always constantly evolving and growing, that dial turn just happens to be just a bit too far in one direction or a bit too different in another direction. Uh, and so being able to kind of go back again with that 2020 hindsight and those lessons learned is very satisfying. And to know that, you know, that character is going to have some new life to it. And we're going to start seeing that character show up. We're going to see our Marvel Squidward have his day again. It's pretty cool. It's the dream. You know, not everything's going to be top tier because that's impossible. We've talked about this before. Perfect balance is literally the worst thing to happen to a game like this because then everything is literally the same. But having that bell curve of power be nice and tight and close. So even if your stuff, the, the characters that you really love, might be on the lower end of that bell curve through skill tactics and a little bit of luck you know it makes very little difference to the end result and that's also why randomization and stuff is so important as well because random elements force creative problem solving because things don't always go according to plan ask josh about that from his thursday game <laughs> sometimes lady luck just decides she doesn't like you that day more often than not though you, find, you fall into that average and things work sometimes and they don't work others and you kind of predict as to when that may or may not occur and sometimes it occurs exactly when you want it to or expect it to and sometimes it doesn't. Who knows? But that's all part of the fun of the game. So as long as things are close, everything works out nice and smooth. All right. Pink is a little washed out on the camera, but I guarantee you it's very pink in person. Oh, why doesn't Wicked's judgment work when Ghost Rider damage? Well, it's part of the... I mean, again, this goes back to the concept of Ghost Rider's role is to force your opponent to make questions. And so rather than have Wicked's judgment work on him... Instead, we just simply made him more durable. So as the opponent 
against Ghost Rider, you can choose to attack the softer target, the weaker target, and maybe suffer Wicked's Judgment if your roll really blows up and there's a Ghost Rider close by. Or you can choose to go after Ghost Rider, in which case he's not going to be able to Wicked's Judgment, but now with the updated stamina values and the new immunities, he's probably going to survive unless you can really like pound into him with multiple attacks or multiple activations, depending on what you're targeting him with. Uh, and then he's going to come back at you with a bunch of power on his activation and be able to do a lot of cool stuff. So that's why. It's to put in the counterplay and the interesting choices that are endemic of the character's design in general. Has Josh recovered mentally? I don't think so. We did play test the, the, on Friday. So Josh did come back and he did, he did play test with us. Uh, and I was very careful not to give him too much crap about his rolling. Mostly I just apologized because, you know, it was, uh, it was a rough. It was rough. <laughs> he handled it like a true champion. There are many of us who just be like, okay, well, this is clearly time. It's time to walk. It's time to, it's time to hang up the dice for a while. But he came right back, jumped into playtest, had a great game. It was clearly a fluke, uh, an entertaining fluke. But who knows? I, we'll find out if he's recovered mentally when we ask him back to play another game of Crisis Protocol. <laughs> it might just have to be not against me. That might be the trick. I'm getting this really bad reputation around the office. I'm not trying to be a bully. It just seems to happen on stream. I don't know why. My day will come, though. I, th I thought Dallas had me a couple of a couple of the games that I played against Dallas. Uh, I really thought he had me, and then things just suddenly shifted at the very end, and we were able to pull it out. But if he uh, he comes at me with a vengeance like he did against Pagani in their last game when they were doing the core set changes. I think my days are numbered. My record against him is about to get really rough. Uh, there won't be a game for MCP this week. Uh, we're going to be doing an X-Wing game this week. And really quick, even though this is... Uh, there'll be some... There should be some very exciting news for everybody who is looking at the other games that we do in the next 24 hours, actually. Uh, so tomorrow's stream, if you're interested in uh, not MCP, it's going to be a good one. We're going to have Michael Plummer and Will Pagani doing some painting, and they're going to be answering all kinds of questions, I imagine, uh, because hopefully by the time that stream happens, there will be several updates going up on the website that all of the Star Wars folks have been waiting for patiently, as patiently as possible. Let's use that. As patiently as they possibly can since Mini Stravaganza. And... It should be a very exciting couple of days. So I'm going to be joined by our licensing director, manager, director, licensing director, Sherry Yeary, and we're going to play some games on Thursday. It should be a good time. And like I said, the Pagani and Plumber We'll be on tomorrow to do some hobby and some painting and to answer all kinds of questions and discuss all of the new stuff that we'll be getting posted, like I said, in the next 24 hours or so. So that stream will be at 1 p.m. Pacific, same as all of our streams. So. 
uh, just more of our painting series that we've been doing every Wednesday. It'll just be those two because I think a lot of folks will want to have a chance to chat, hang out, and discuss stuff with them. Ooh. I want to see if I can maybe get this color to get all fixed here. Oh, yeah, there we go. Uh, that's better. I'm just messing with these camera options to see if we can't get it to show a bit more. And there. Just had to mess with some camera options. So that's much closer to what I'm seeing in person as far as our pink goes. And it's very, very lavender. Uh, I think it's just because our lighting is a little weird in this studio. So, look, pink is cool. Like, you gotta love pink. It just, it, it nails it, like, so much. Um, so this is about it. I mean, we've been working on these flames for quite a while. Uh, obviously, we could continue to, like, blow out some of the highlights and, and add those little hot spots by adding a bit more white, a bit more pink. Like for instance, even though I'm out of time, I'm going to go through and do this, like, right here on the whole thing. And then, like, maybe closer down here. And because these are somewhat unnatural flames, you know, they're fake flames, you could definitely kind of play with where that color is coming from. Um, you know, mostly, most of the time with fire, <clears throat> it gets darker towards the end of the flame rather than lighter, but because we have like this weird purple hellfire thing going on, um, I like making the center darker and then having it trail out to the lighter color uh, from the top, which is subtle, but it also tells the eye that, hey, this isn't really natural. Like, this is not how flames work. Um, so it makes it feel a bit more magical and mystic rather than like a naturally occurring thing. But that pretty much uh, sums us up here. So plenty more, like... <laughs> stuff to do on the bike and everything else. Uh, you know, we want to go back through and we can do some highlighting and some adjustments on the blacks and the browns. Definitely need to get some washes in here, do some highlighting on the bike. But overall, we did the fun part, which is definitely, definitely, definitely the fire and radically different from the norm. So, there is our ghost rider for Spooky Halloween. Thank you very much for joining me. I hope you had a blast. I uh, hope you're as excited as I am to see the updates to our good friend Johnny Blaze, aka Ghost Rider. Be sure to join us back tomorrow. Will Pagani and Michael Plummer will be on uh, doing some Legion painting and, of course, answering all of the exciting questions and here to chat and talk about the new updates that are going to be coming in the next 24 hours. Uh, for those of you who are looking forward to them, can't wait. Otherwise, uh, take care. We will see you on the next one. Thanks for joining me. Have a wonderful week and goodbye.